Okay. I think we are right in time to um, move on to the next presentation from Rosamira on the Proyecto Titi. So uh, I'll leave the floor to Rosamira. Go ahead. There we go. <laughs> yeah, got it. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to share with you a little bit of our uh, conservation work and our experience with the conservation standards. So I'm going to share my uh, screen. Just a second, and um, okay. Can you see my screen now? The beautiful cotton tops there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is the focus of our study: the very cute cotton top tamarins. Little one pound monkeys that are found in this beautiful uh, forest in Northern Colombia. It's the tropical dry forest that is home um, to the cutest monkey, we call it, not that we're biased or anything. Uh, but uh, they're very little, but very much similar like us humans. They live in family groups, mom, dad, and the babies and the kids. Um, uh, babies learn everything from their parents, just like we do. Very, very territorial. You know taking up uh, pieces of the forest for their family. Um, babies, when they grow to be juveniles, they either leave home, or they get kicked out of their homes like we do, right? <laughs> and they also have a very sophisticated communication um, uh, method, like uh, language, like cotton top language, just like humans do. So primates, after all, right, we have a lot of similarities with regards with uh, social behavior and um, group composition and all sorts of uh, uh, specifics. So this is uh, our beautiful monkeys. But uh, two things to keep in mind is that this, this cute little monkey only lives in that little red dot uh, within our planet. Just this little corner of the planet is the country of Colombia. And even within the country, it is just that black spot that you see on the map. Just that's the only place on earth you will find cotton top tamarins in the wild. They're 100% Colombian. And unfortunately, like many other species around our planet, they're facing uh, lots of challenges for their long-term survival, um, mostly deforestation to give way to cattle ranching, agriculture, mining now, uh, and urban expansion altogether, but also domestic uses from local communities such as selective logging for commercial purposes or uh, firewood fences uh, construction in, in a smaller scale. And uh, sadly, uh, they are hunted for the illegal pet trade. So those threats have put cotton top um, in the verge of extinction. They are considered a critically endangered species. And we estimate there's about 7,000 cotton tops left in the wild in less than 8% of the forest that used to cover um, uh, the area, their distribution area a few decades um, ago. So that, that is why they are now critically endangered and being endemic of Northern Colombia. Well, I represent Proyecto Titi, a um, nonprofit organization based in Colombia. It, the project itself was founded by Dr. Ann Savage, which is uh, an American biologist that came about over 30 years ago to conduct her thesis, her dissertation uh, work, studying cotton top tamarins in the wild. And over the, that period, we have uh, turned into an integrated conservation project that combines um, field research, which was the core of the project in its beginnings, um, combined with a forest conservation, given that the main threat is a forest habitat loss, but then also a, a strong a social component that includes environmental education programs and awareness, and also um, livelihood improvement alternatives so that uh, communities don't have to necessarily rely fully on forest resources for subsistence. So I'm going to touch on uh, one, a little bit on each of these programs and then I'll tell you our experience with the conservation standards. So we work with telemetry. We put a telemetry transmitter in the, the father of the family group, the dominant male. He carries it as a little backpack there, as you can see. That helps us find them. You know, we're talking about a one pound monkey 30 to 40 feet above the ground on a lush uh, tropical environment. So uh, that helps us locate them in the field. 
and then we can go ahead and collect information, um, um, you know, detecting the signal from the transmitter and taking notes on an iPad that takes information on a cloud. And then we can retrieve the information and do all sorts of analysis. We have been able to publish quite a, abundant information about cutting tops in the wild, which has also uh, given us a lot of information to uh, design strategies that can um, help uh, secure a long-term future for the species. We have also conducted um, two census, two uh, population surveys in the last 20 years that actually have been the base of uh, the decisions to um, designate the species as a critically endangered species. And we are about to start the third census after nine years that will show us how our um, conservation practice has helped the species. That'll be an interesting process that we will start by the end of this year, COVID allows. Our second pillar uh, of our conservation work is forest uh, conservation. And that has like three, three legs. One is working with environmental authorities to designate public protected areas. Uh, we've been able to uh, create four protected areas that add up to 5,400 uh, acres, I'm sorry, hectares at the moment. We have created our own private reserve that has grown to 260 hectares. And um, because of the issue of fragmentation of whatever forest is left, we're also creating and connecting isolated forest patches, um, like green highways, like you see here on farmers' lands, you know, to counterpart for um, the uh, uh, fragmentation of the habitat, since cotton tops never come down to the ground, so they need continuous forest to find resources and territory. So we're creating networks of forest corridors that combine these three strategies, which is public protected areas, like Los Colorados here, a national park. The green is a uh, forest reserve and, and it's expansion areas. And the colorful uh, areas are farmers' lands, which we work with uh, through conservation agreements and then uh, involve them in the process of propagating saplings, planting them, and uh, monitoring to see how the, those restoration efforts progress over time and to uh, evidence that cotton tops use them and that it generates the benefit we want. This is what we want, cotton tops moving freely through these corridors and being able to find resources and, um, and food and territory. And I know our focus is uh, cotton top tamarinds, but we're saving uh, a, a forest that is good to many other uh, species that share a home with cotton tops in the tropical dry forest of Northern Colombia and also people. So we're trying basically to uh, protect an ecosystem that provides a lot of uh, ecological services to uh, the local communities. And that's where our social work comes through, um, starting with our education programs that begin in elementary school, teaching kids the difference from domestic animals to um, wild animals and why wild animals should not be kept as pets. Then we have programs for secondary school, which um, are a little more go deeper into the threats and solutions specifically. Take kids to the forest to see cotton tops and that's where we make like the emotional connection with them and um, identify young leaders that can either become employees like Rosita here, who went through all of the programs and now is one of our teachers, or uh, ambassadors in the local communities that move on to other areas of work, but um, support our work from wherever they are. And of course, our um, annual celebration of the Day of the Cotton Top Tamarind in August. This is of course pre-COVID, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, we're, you know, eager to go back into, into the communities um, and we've had to go virtual, but we all know that's not as fun as in person. Um, and our last uh, pillar is uh, livelihood improvement. And we have some signature projects like the Eco Mochilas, um, which are, are tote bags made with recycled plastic bags um, that litter so much. We've been able to create a small enterprise of, of women in these local communities that crochet these beautiful bags made with uh, trash, basically. And they can do this from their homes and it's been very beneficial to them. And it's been a long-term project. It's been 16 years, I think. They've been able to uh, work with fashion designers locally and um, be in the shelves of prestigious uh, stores combining Mm, crocheting with recycled plastic with beautiful, you know, other materials. We also have the beautiful 
flesh toys here. Whoops, there we go. <laughs> um, the, another group of ladies that make these plush toys and deliver a message of not having cotton tops in the wild. I mean, um, as pets, but keep them in the wild. And then our ecotourism program that had to be put on hold as well uh, because of COVID, but hopefully by next year we can uh, resume. That provided the opportunity for people to connect, see the monkeys in the wild and connect with the work of local communities. Okay, so um, to redirect to how we have used the conservation standards. Um, this is a summary. I didn't want to use the variety because it had uh, a lot of uh, information. It is a little uh, dense, but this is a summary of our um, strategic uh, plan. We, uh, for, for many years, Proyecto Titi grew very organically, um, started as a field research project. And along the way, of course, we realized that the threats were many and that science alone was not going to be able to save these species or uh, its habitat. So um, we, you know, we did our first uh, strategic plan development using uh, conservation standards with the support of Foundations of Success and our dear friend Armando Valdez, who's been our advisor for uh, nine years already. We started in 2013, did our first five-year strategic plan. Um, and we are now in the third year of the second uh, five-year period. And I wanted to share with you the most important or the highlights or the learned lessons, if so, that have helped us a lot, a lot throughout the process of planning our work and implementing it and measuring it. So we basically have two conservation targets. Uh, we're working with four of the main threats that we feel we can uh, somehow affect positively for the species and the habitat, and then some programmatic strategies and institutional strategies that are based in those four pillars. So forest restoration, forest protection, education, uh, livelihood improvements, research, um, um, awareness, and um, sustainability in the long term. But one thing I, I uh, it seems obvious, but <laughs> To us, it helped us a lot. As, as small conservation organizations, we tend to get distracted, uh, especially if we find a funding opportunity that seems interesting, but it doesn't necessarily fit with our program. We're trying to twist it to try to make it work. And uh, we learned not to do that. Learn to focus uh, in, in, in the target, uh, but also in the threats that we can make a difference on and the solutions we can implement. You know, there are some things that as a small conservation organization, we're not gonna be able to do with the resources and with, uh, with the uh, human resources and financial resources. So we, throughout this process, we have learned to focus on the end result, on your goal, focus on the threats that you're able to affect, focus on the solutions that you're able to provide to reduce these threats. That takes me to the second um, uh, learned lesson is to just be realistic because uh, we are um, very ambitious as, as conservation organizations. We want to save the, the world. And, and sometimes we get completely out of scale. We need to understand that what scale are we working on and be realistic about what kind of change you can generate in such a short period of time. Uh, we're going like by five years. Of course, we're in it for the long term, but we want to see results and be able to share that with our supporters and uh, get them engaged to continue supporting our work. So we need, really need to be realistic of what we're able to do with a small team and uh, limited resources. And we have learned to um, focus and be realistic uh, and practical as well of what we can do to, um, to, to help uh, protect cotton top tamarins. And of course, I, I heard you talking about measuring and, and evidence in, in the previous talk. And of course, that, this is always the, the, the challenge. Um, the, uh, the measuring, first of all, having a baseline, you know, sometimes you just go, go do whatever you need to do, but forget that you need something to compare where you started. And it seems so obvious, but sometimes it's, it's not for uh, uh, some of us. So we have learned to... Uh, to find indicators that we can measure because we did that the first uh, five-year period. 
we had these wonderful indicators, but then we realized that it was impossible for us to do that with the staff that we have and with the resources. And nobody wants to pay for that with regards to funding. You know, it's very hard. So, um, so we learned to find indicators that are incorporated into our day to day and that we can use our staff and our resources to, to establish those baselines, uh, the baseline information, and then measure against that to show progress or, or not, or to show challenges and then um, to overcome them along the way. Um, and um, evaluate and adapt. And this is something that we have enjoyed very much. And it is to meet every year specifically to talk about how we're doing. Um, the frequency works for us, you know, once a year by the end of the year, kind of look back and say, okay, this, this is working really great. We're gonna go on with this. And this is not working. We need to make a, you know, stop and go. Uh, and change. And, and of course, I know you all relate to the huge adaptation we just went through with the COVID uh, that also affected uh, the way we do things, especially the social work, so uh, education and livelihood. But we have, it has become second nature to us to be always to meet every year and evaluate and just be critical with ourselves and understand that we can take whatever direction we decide as a group to take, as long as we don't lose the focus and be realistic with what we are able to do in such a, you know, with, with our resources we have. And last but not least, uh, involving the team. You know, when we started with our first uh, strategic plan, we were three people um, in, in our, three people participating in the, the planning sessions. It was a, like a, I don't know, an eight people team. We're now 30 uh, people. And we have be, along the way been able to involve field coordinators. They come, you know, we come together and everybody, the people working in the field bring the information. And, and that has been, I don't know why you don't think about that when you're in, in your beginning stages, because the information that we collect from the field is the most valuable information to make decisions about uh, how to go, uh, you know, on the next steps and adapt. So. The other thing is that me as a leader have, I have a very clear view and vision of what our organization, where it's going and what, what it wants to do. But I realized that a lot of our um, staff in the field, you know, they know their, their work, but they have no idea what they're, how is, how it, is it all connected? So bringing in the field coordinators has been very helpful to, uh, to uh, bring the information down to the, to the to all levels in the organization and understand that if I'm helping with the restoration program, what I'm doing is propagating plants to plant them, monitor them and have forests grow back for cotton top tamarinds. And then if I'm working with education, I know that I'm increasing awareness and this is what I need to measure. And this is how I'm contributing to the end goal. So even though we're in separate uh, field sites and separate areas of our work, everybody knows what the end goal, the end goal is. And that was uh, achieved bringing people to our yearly adapt adaptive, management, adaptive management meetings and making them part of the process and listening to everything uh, they say coming from the field. As we're talking about the team, let me acknowledge them. Uh, these are uh, the very passionate people that work with us in um, trying to secure a future for cotton top cameras in the forest home. Thank you very much. That's our um, social media and uh, website information if you're interested in learning more about that. And I'd be happy to take your questions. I think I'm right within time, right? Yes, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> very interesting. Um, and we have, I think, a bit more than 10 minutes for your questions again. So if you have anything to ask. I, I didn't get into much of the details, but I'm happy to answer questions. I didn't want to, I wanted to give you the context and then like uh, highlight the, the main uh, learnings or experiences about the process, but I'm happy to answer any detailed questions about um, e either of those learned lessons if you want, if you're interested. So I guess to say thanks, excellent. Um, could I could I ask you a question? Thank you. Yes, 
Yeah. yeah so, they're all really, really super. Thank you so much. Nice visuals there as well. Really enjoyed them. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted, you know, a bit of a detailed question, but you, you mentioned about indicators and things that you decided that actually you couldn't monitor in the end or weren't realistic mm -hmm. or something. Uh, could you pick up uh, even on just one or two examples of things that you decided actually <coughs> were not realistic to monitor, even though it would have been nice and how that or what you did monitor instead to bring that to life a bit? Yes. So one of the things is um, our uh, one of the main threats for cotton tops is the illegal pet trade. And at the beginning, we had established uh, uh, an indicator that said, we want to reduce by 5% the keeping of cotton top tamarins as pets in this local community. And uh, for, for one thing, we didn't have a baseline. So how are we going to measure against that? That was something we did in the first uh, period, right? And the, the other big problem is that it's impossible to... Uh, to measure that in these communities. Um, once people know you are working for Project T and your uh, uh, conservation organization, they will tell you they don't have the animals. They will not show you the animals. And if you go there, you will not be able to evidence that it's actually uh, yes or a no for keeping, for keeping an animal um, as, as a pet, right? Uh, the other thing we wanted to rely on was uh, information, confiscation information from the environmental authorities. Well, that wasn't available either. And what they do have available is some numbers, but they don't show the real situation because uh, they don't have what to do with the animals when they are confiscated. So what they're doing is that they're avoiding confiscations because then it becomes a problem for the environmental authorities. So there's no, there was no way to get uh, reliable information about increase or decrease of uh, traffic numbers or keeping uh, animals as pets. So we realized that, it, and, then, and then we chose this 5%, and we don't know if that's little or a lot. It, 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 so we don't know if, we didn't know if, we could attribute that to our work or to something else. So it, it, it got complicated. We were not able to measure that, uh, that indicator or collect the information. So what we decided to do was uh, measure intent of having cotton top tamarins as a pet from interviews of our students in our community work. And it's not a hard evidence, but it shows if people are really getting the message and understanding that they should not have cotton tops as pets. That's what we're measuring now in the second stage. We're also trying to measure attitudes of kids uh, towards conservation of cotton tops and the forest home. And what we're doing is keeping anecdotal records of um, cotton tops in the pet trade. And we know that's probably not fully reliable, but at least it's a measure of how things are happening. And, and as we have become visible, people call us a lot to say, hey, I saw a cotton top there um, kept as a pet, or I saw somebody in the road selling a cotton top. So what, we, what we're doing now is documenting all of those phone calls, emails, uh, chats, Instagram uh, uh, messages, and keeping a record of how many times we get reports now, that also can be tricky because, you know, if you become more visible, people now know they can report. We don't know if that is happening more or less. They're reporting more now, which is good for us to know that we're visible. But at the same time, you know, it's hard to compare with previous years. So we're using that to just keep track and to also help solve the problem by uh, help working with authorities to find a, a temporary shelter for these animals and uh, avoid that they are released uh, irresponsibly or, uh, or kept as pets. So, you know, problems like that, it's just like, it's not. You have to find alternative ways to, to, to measure the impact of your work and you, that you can correlate that what you're doing is, is generating that change of attitude or perception or intention. To, to try to have some evidence of the impact of your work, which is what we want, all want to measure, right? We have a few others, but I don't want to extend on that. <laughs> no, thank you. That was really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Paulina, you had a question. 
Uh, well, Rosa Maria uh, answered my question, so thank you for that uh, extensive response. Um, uh, felicitaciones del trabajo. It's, it's really uh, amazing. I loved your presentation. Maybe one oh, yeah. additional topic is, you know, you mentioned about the scaling and the importance of being both practical and realistic, but also uh, needing to cover a large area with a small team. So maybe if you could talk a little bit more about how you have approached the, the scaling strategy and, and what that means for your organization. Yeah, the, uh, the, we had higher expectations in, in like, for instance, you think that with your education programs you, or with your community programs, you're gonna affect 100% of the population that you're working with. That's not realistic. There's people that don't care. So you need to work with those who are interested and are uh, interested in involving, are, are somehow motivated to participate and, and aware that they, the, the commitments they acquire when they participate in our programs. But um, we, have, we have researched a lot about you know, what forces left, our strategies working in communities around areas that are already protected either public protected areas or private protected areas um, so that we can guarantee that that core uh, forest that has cotton tops, of course, um, has a protection uh, stage. And then we, 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 we make a plan locally, even though we have a, vi a global vision uh, of the areas where we would like to work. But we're not gonna expect that people on the other end of the distribution area have a change in attitude if we're not working there. So, it, it, you know, we have adjusted our expectations and we have established the scale within the communities that we're working and we're working with that uh, frame of, of, of data. So if we have, uh, you know, thousand people population, you know, we establish percentages and numbers that we wanna reach and what in, in statistical samples that we wanna measure, that's how we scale our work. And what we're doing is if, if we have the resources, uh, financial resources to do so in our long-term plan, we wanna create more satellite uh, satellites of the project that work at a smaller scale within that community in that protected area, but they're all together with the same vision and with the same model of bringing, bringing research, force protection, community work and education all together on every site that we go to just so that we can get like a well-rounded approach to, to, the, to the main threats and to, uh, and, and to affecting. And, and we're standardizing the way we measure things like pre and post for education programs, measuring knowledge, pre and post attitude changes and um, behavior is a little harder. But with community, we have done a couple of, I, I heard you talking about how hard it is, you know, if you don't have a baseline where well, we do a retrospective study and, and try to measure impact based on perception, because it's all what people believe that if it's been good or not for them without any hard uh, data. And, but it's still valid, valid in the social sciences, I believe. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to adjust this to the scale uh, with a larger vision in the longer term, but being realistic that this is as much as we can do right now and not get discouraged because you wanna save the world and we're just doing this. When you zoom out on the map of Colombia, then you realize that your protected area is just this little bit of land. Don't get discouraged. We're just like, okay, let's, let's zoom in, zoom back in <laughs> and realize that we are making a difference. We're increasing hectares of forest. We are restoring forest areas. We're educating XX kids every year and we're benefiting XX families every year. So we try to kind of like, don't lose that. Um, sense of scale. Thanks. And if, if you want to read more about it, um, Judy shared a link in the chat on a study pub published about the effectiveness of the livelihood activity through yes. testing assumptions. <laughs> we just published that a few months yeah. ago. And uh, maybe one last question from Becky. Go ahead, Becky. Hi, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Great, Rosamira, that's excellent presentation. Um, I'm Becky Rayboy. Yeah. I work with golden-headed lion tamarins, uh, mm. similar species <laughs> in Bahia, Brazil. Um, and I wanted to ask you this question, um, something that we're grappling with. The last several years, we've been uh, trying to um, fit our work into the framework of the conservation standards. And we were thinking about ultimate indicators um, 
well, any kind of indicator along the way, we have um, a theory of change, uh, you know, framework and certain results and indicators tied to them. But sort of ultimately, we'd like to be able to measure um, an effect in population size, right, mm -hmm. of the golden-headed lion tamarind. However, there's two things that make this sort of complicated, and we wonder if we should sort of run after this. One is that the ability to do the census work that you need to do um, is just really hard to get those resources. Uh, people trained the money, everything like that, uh, to do that, and to do that well enough that it's an accurate estimate of the population size. And the other thing is the time for the, the the time span you're dealing with, right? So generation time of the species that you're working with. So if you're talking about in a conservation standards framework saying that uh, you know you're you're doing five year intervals, right? Um, you may not even see a change in population size as a result of your work. I mean, it may be happening in the background, right, that <laughs> things are getting better for the species, uh, but you need a certain amount of time, uh, you know, more than five years to see that. So I just wondered how your team addresses that. Is that one of, is population size one of your indicators and how do you go about measuring it? Yes, of course, that's one of our indicators. And, and that's exactly what happened to us, what you're saying, Becky, is we did our first uh, census, the, 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 the first ever census of cotton top tamarins in, within their distribution, and it was in, in 2005 and 2006. And then five years after, we did the second one uh, in 2012 and 13. And we realized exactly that. There wasn't enough time to see a change in, the, in it, it, what, what the results showed using the same methods, the same sample and everything, it was just a slight decrease, but it wasn't statistically significant. Uh, that was the conclusion. That's why we decided to wait 10 years. And then we're about to start, for next year, we're gonna start a third population census. It's, you know, we're gonna see how we do and see what kind of changes we, we find. And that's gonna teach us if we need to do it every 15 years or every 20 years or not. But what we're doing in the meantime is that we know we have that longer term goal of measuring every year how the population is doing. But, you know, this will give us like this is going to fit perfectly with the end of our second five year period for strategic planning. And that's going to give us light about how our work it's impacting. It's, you know, it, it, we're hoping it's for the good, right? But, you know, whatever comes out, we will be working with that and saying, okay, this has been effective, this is not. It will be major, probably, adaptive management by the end of that population census to realize how to move forward. But I think that we are aware enough that what the species needs is forest. So we're getting ahead and planting forest, protecting forest, and focusing a lot of our efforts on the habitat. And of course, awareness and all that, but mainly habitat, because we know that for the last 10 years and that the main threat for the species and is evidence in everything we do is habitat loss. So it's like you gain time by protecting the forest and then do this, uh, you know, large period. Um, and you make some assumptions when you're planning, you know, for shorter periods of time. But I think five years has worked for us because it just gives us enough time to do some things like they're going to protect him. Uh, creating a nursery, you know, propagating plants. And we have done that in a short period of time, but we know that we have to wait longer for, for, uh, to see the result of that. But you kind of anticipate a little when you kind of learn to know about the context and the challenges and you keep working on those that you can affect in the short term, hoping that in the long term, you'll find better results with your sur surveys. But that's exactly what the, the conclusion we, we came up with. Um, we do have two publications on the first two surveys. If you want to review them, I'll be happy to share them with you because it shows the methods and it, it might apply. I don't know if it might or not. The Calitrix it's anyway, right? Mm -hmm. and, and might help to learn because this was a method designed specifically for cotton top tamarins or for Calitrix, given their uh, their behavior and their their uh, yeah behavior patterns. So it might be useful to to read. If you're interested, let me know. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you a little bit later about that. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Um, right in time. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I think uh, before we go to the initiatives updates, uh, we have a poll, right, Caroline? Is that 
Yes, um, and I think our translators are dropping off at this point. Um, but if uh, others from the community can stay around, at least for the poll, that would be fantastic. Um, and thank you to the, the translators. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, okay, I'll, I'll let you guys go. Thank you so much for listening. And, you know, if Carolyn has my email just in case you um, have any more questions or want to learn more about us. Thank you and good luck with your meeting. Thank you, Rosa Mayra. Thanks. Um, okay, the poll is coming in just a moment. Please ignore, I just put the link to the, the notes in there. Um, I'll put it in the chat this, link. Yep, here it comes. Um, so we just have a poll for you all about these translation services that we've been testing out. Love to hear from you. Um, if you click on the link that's in the chat box, uh, you can also, Am I sharing my screen? No, let me share my screen. Um, there's also a way to text. Um, if you prefer that, I'll put that in the chat box too. And it should be open. Um, if you're running into problems, let me know. But it's just a, a few questions to get a sense of, um, of the importance of doing these uh, translations. So, um, uh, Maybe just give a a couple minutes for that, or a, a, a minute or so. You can see on my screen, in case you're interested, things are starting to populate. On the third question, um, the the or actually, I guess it's the second one, um, where we asked the priority, the highest priority languages, we would ideally have every language <laughs> we possibly could. Um, and the the cost is reasonable, but um, it every language you add starts to increase things. So, um, so that's why it's worded that way. We've got some comments. Great to hear the Spanish interpretation was excellent. Um, okay, great, great suggestions here coming in to share the, the PowerPoints ahead of time, provide them some standard terms. Um, we did previously for our, our um, last session, we did not do that again for this one. So I think that's a really um, great reminder. Um, and that question about how many partners are benefiting from the translation services.